recording this. It sure is. We'll be recording this meeting for the purposes of preparing the minutes. Um, so no roll call at this point. Is that right, Grace? You can take a formal roll call um, and we'll then just acknowledge that we do not have a quorum, so we won't be able to vote on the minutes. Okay, so with that, I will take a roll call for today's meeting and then we can move on with our business. So, uh, Gaming Commission Chair Judd Stein. Here. Uh, Senator Feingold. Here on his behalf, I don't know if that counts. Yeah, okay. Uh, Senator Fatman. Representative Ferrante. Representative Vaughn. Mr. Ortiz. Here. Uh, Commissioner Calton Harris. Mr. Picknelli. Here. Mr. McNeil. Here. Ms. Sprague. Here. And I, Dean Serpa, am present. All right. So Grace, she'll make the proper notification, uh, uh, notice of that. Um, I, I guess I should uh, start this meeting first, though, recognizing a new member of our committee who was unable to attend our May meeting. We've all seen her on the screen. Green, Caitlin Sprague. I've had the pleasure of working with Caitlin in the past. Hello, Caitlin. She is one of my favorite get things done people. So I'm confident she will bring valuable experience to our committee. Looking forward to working with you, Caitlin. Do you, Caitlin, have anything that you want to say to introduce yourself to the committee? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to meet the rest of you that I don't know already, and I'm so excited for this work. Um, I uh, actually, while I was in law school, I co-founded a gaming law association um, and uh, was lucky enough to be working in the Massachusetts State House um, when we passed um, the 2011 gaming law. So I've always been super interested in this policy work, and I'm really excited to um, be here with you all today. Uh, great. That's, that's that's something I didn't know, Caitlin. So now another thing I know. Uh, well, we're looking forward to it. Certainly, keep your ideas coming. Any information that you need as a new member, and uh, we'll make sure to get it to you. <clears throat> okay. So now um, I'm going to turn it over to the Gaming Commission Chair Judd Stein for her update. And um, I know she's got a lot of information coming our way. So Kathy, go right ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. And it was nice being able to just chat a little bit before our meeting formally um, opened. I want to thank um, you, Dean, uh, Chair Serpa. Um, <clears throat> and on behalf of my fellow commissioner at the MGC, we thank each of you committee members and the chair for your time and most of all for your help in supporting our work and policy development. Uh, <clears throat> just briefly on what you're going to hear, I think you're in for a treat today. You'll hear about the work of our newly formed sports wagering division. Uh, Crystal Boschman, I understand, will be presenting. Her colleague, Andrew Steffen, is here. Um, so many of you may remember that Crystal last served as my chief administrative officer and special projects manager to the commission. And she was promoted to her current position of sports wagering business manager as we launched legalized sports wagering. And she has taken off. Um, I know that Andrew works closely with Crystal, and he will agree that she's been instrumental in advising the commission on various requests from operators who are working hard to stay in compliance with our regulatory framework. Uh, Crystal is diligent and effective in <clears throat> building both internal and external relationships that further our mission, <clears throat> excuse me, mission. And I'm so excited, this is big news, to announce that she has just been selected by the Emerging Leaders of Gaming and Global Gaming Business to be a member of the Emerging Leaders Gaming 40 Under 40 Class of 2024. So we applaud you and I'm very proud of Crystal um, and her uh, progress in development, professional development at the MGC. You'll also hear today from the leader of our HR and DEI division, 
To elevate our commitment to diversity and inclusion matters, we hired a chief people and diversity officer a year and a half ago. Chief David Muldrew has brought significant experience and I dare say gravitas to our HR program and intentionality to our efforts advancing diversity, particularly hiring and spending goals. He has recently expanded his division to include Beniswa Sundai, and uh, who will present today as well. And Beniswa, hello, your background is beautiful. You look beautiful. Um, she um, brings extensive experience to her role as senior DEI program manager. Finally, uh, he's not here right now. He's in a meeting, but you'll hear from uh, Chief of our Community Affairs Division, Joe Delaney. We'll update you on his and his team's work on the Community Mitigation Grant Program. He's looking at some policy um, changes that we'll actually be exploring again tomorrow at our next commission meeting. And I'm I pleased that uh, committee member Paul Pignelli is going to give some highlights from Springfield. I just got the chance to see um, Paul and um, he'll be highlighting the plans underway um, at Springfield to further the revitalization and activation of the downtown area near MGC, MGM Springfield. I asked um, Chief Delaney for an accounting of the grants that um, the commission has awarded to the city of Springfield since, since the fund's inception. And Grace, I think it's been since 2017 that the commission has awarded in 25 separate grants to offset the impacts of the casino location to Springfield, $8,081,478.68. So we are very proud of the Gaming Commission's commitment. And I see my colleague, um, uh, uh, Commissioner Maynard um, present. And thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Maynard and I were out in Springfield and we, um, are very proud of our commitment uh, to the Springfield area. <clears throat> Other quick updates, PPC opened its new sports book and that's the sports book at Plain Ridge Park. I just had a nice tour with Andrew there. I encourage all to visit our properties and particularly this new sports book, which um, is heavy in um, Boston sports themes and there'll be a lot of familiar attractions there for you to visit. Yesterday, the commission held a three hour virtual round table discussion on our data privacy regulation with representation from all online sports wagering licensees, the Attorney General's Office, our technology consultants from GLI, and a responsible gaming expert. Uh, with the collaboration of the Attorney General's Office, I would say significant uh, contributions from that office, we have adopted a regulation addressing customer data sharing and usage. And the operators ask us to revisit that regulation, even though they'd already ex uh, submitted extensive comments because they really did want to discuss both policy and implement implementation questions. And um, it was a very um, extensive discussion. And I think all of us left feeling it was very worthwhile. That round table, um, although virtual has worked out to be a, a really helpful mechanism for getting expertise and insights from stakeholders. Um, wherever they come from. Uh, of note, we said goodbye um, to two of our um, team leaders. Our executive director, Karen Wells, departed after 10 years of leadership service at the MGC, and those, those years were outstanding. Her, her contributions, so significant. Um, <clears throat> we are retaining an executive search firm for a nationwide search and have appointed a screening committee in which uh, Commissioner Maynard is a member. Um, and which complies fully with the open meeting law expectations. Our general counsel, Todd Grossman, was selected to be the interim executive director. Our director of the investigations and enforcement bureau, Loretta Lilios, many of you, Loretta, retired from state service after nearly 10 years of service at the MGC in the long, um, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, career before that. And uh, the MGC is in the process for selecting a new IEB director. We'll be looking at that process tomorrow um, as well. Our chief enforcement counsel, Heather Hall, um, has stepped into Loretta's uh, shoes. She would say difficult to do, but she has taken off um, and is doing very well as our interim director. And our horse racing season at Plain Ridge Park continues. The 
weather is cooperating so far this fall nicely. Um, and our racing license application, which is an annual process, um, is due October 1st for both new and renewed licenses. And the commission must act on those applications um, by November 15th. And finally, this month is Responsible Gaming Education Month and our RG division continues to be a thought leader in this nation and around the world. We are super proud of our, of our program and particularly of our GameSense advisors who are available on all three casino floors, online and by phone to help uh, betting patrons in Massachusetts make informed and healthy choices to keep gaming and gambling fun. So um, with that, Dean Serpa, <clears throat> yep. Chair Serpa, um, yeah. uh, thank you, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Kathy. That was a, a nice update. As usual, you've got a lot going on at the commission, and um, I'm not sure I keep it all straight, but uh, lots of moving parts. I enjoy learning about it every day. Um, I guess before we sort of move on a minute, does anybody have questions for Kathy just on that information she just delivered? Um, okay, so uh, we'll move on to minutes, but I think we won't move on to minutes, right, Grace? Uh, yes. We don't have a quorum for this meeting, so the minutes for this meeting will be just done in uh, for the future. For our last, most recent May meeting, they'll stay in draft form, and then for the two uh, prior meetings to that, we also don't have a quorum for approval. Is that right? That is correct. All minutes will remain in draft form. All right. So like Grace said, all minutes will remain in draft form. Um, so I guess in that situation, we should move forward with our business. The first item on the agenda is the sports wagering presentation. Um, uh, committee members, uh, we'll probably remember that in our May meeting, we heard from the sports wagering division um, about the initial up, um, online of sports wagering and uh, the launch. And, but as you know, the work for promulgating this new industry is uh, ongoing for sure. And Kathy and I thought it would be beneficial to hear again from sports wagering with an update. So Crystal, I know you're gonna uh, do the presentation and Andrew also, is that right? That's correct, I'll kick it off and then Andrew yeah. will close out for us. Being correct and Andrew, I am so sorry. I thought this was Crystal's show today, but Andrew is doing double duty at the Gaming Commission. As I mentioned, I saw him at Plain Ridge Park Casino where he um, is, and forgive me, I want you to give your title, Andrew, when you introduce yourself, but, um, he is uh, primary uh, gaming, our gaming agent representative at PPC, and now is stepping into a big position at the sports, at sports wagering operator manager, doing two hats. So thank you. Sorry and doing a great that. job. <laughs> um, Looking we forward asked... to hearing from both of you. Go right ahead. Yeah, great. Um, just give me one moment to start the presentation. And. All good there? Everyone can see that? Okay. Yeah, great. All great. right, so as uh, Chair Serpa had said, we had come before the GPAC in May uh, to provide some of the milestones um, between the August 1st uh, date passed in the legislature and then the 310, the March 10th uh, wagering, uh, online wagering launch. So we had a bit of a 45 day snapshot. So today we're gonna give you more updates on the um, almost six months now since the category three launch that March date. And um, as stated, Andrew is gonna join me toward the latter piece of this as we have had a little bit of a shift since the last um, update. And we are now, um, welcoming Andrew as interim operations manager. Do you wanna do a little introduction, Andrew? Uh, sure, uh, my name is Andrew Stefan. I am the interim sports wagering operations manager. Um, I am also the casino regulatory manager for our investigations and enforcement bureau working out of our office down in Plainville. 
and he's doing a fabulous job. <laughs> I'm really excited to still have a team member. Um, and Andrew has a lot of experience, which Sterl had, and it's re been really helpful so far. So we're learning a lot from each other, I think. Um, so just to kick this off, we um, have here just a reminder for you of the licensees as they stand for sports wagering. Um, we've had no new licensees since uh, come on board since that May date, but uh, Fanatics actually launched. They had received their uh, their uh, operation certificate, but uh, they are now operational. So you have Encore, Boston Harbor, MGM Springfield, Plain Ridge Park Casino in the retail set. You have uh, all of the rest in the category three, um, which include the tethered and untethered options. So you have WinBet and Caesars, that MGM uh, Barstool, which will be switching over soon. That's part of my next update. And Fanatics as tethered um, operators. And then we have DraftKings, FanDuel, and Better in our untethered categories. And uh, at some point in 2024, we intend to be seeing Valley Bet and Betway come on board. Uh, just to give you a little idea of um, how the market share has looked in this last six months, this is a uh, inclusive of um, from March 10th until uh, just the other day, September 13th. This comes from our partner GeoComply. We can log in and see this data at any time. Um, so, you know, exactly what you expect. I think this hasn't changed a lot from um, the last presentation, but DraftKings, FanDuel, and BetMGM holding a significant percentage, and then um, the rest of them leading in that last quarter of the pie. Some quick updates for you. A couple of these uh, Chair Dred Stein already went through, but um, we have seen a bit of an uptick um, in our wagering activities since the NFL season came back. We just in, um, just since NFL launched, we have seen uh, 9.2 million geolocation tra transactions. And just for clarity, that doesn't mean that's how many wagers have been placed. A geolocation transaction can be anything from creating your first account and we have to verify the geolocation to placing a wager in which, again, we have to make sure before that wager is placed, you're in the state. And of note, it can include any passes or fails. So if someone failed for one reason and then attempted again, that, that would create two transactions. So not all of those uh, transactions are wagers, um, but we have also seen almost 60,000 new accounts created um, between that uh, week of uh, September 3rd to the 10th when NFL came back online. Um, as far as uh, regulations, just uh, as Chair Judge Stein just said, we um, have been reviewing the data privacy regulation. We held a, a really significant roundtable this week uh, that is um, still being reviewed. Some that have come online uh, relevant to marketing in the last couple weeks include the promotional offers. Um, offers um, referring a friend is no longer allowed in Massachusetts, and they had a waiver through um, August 1st to wrap up any uh, existing promotions related to that, and those have been completed and they're in play, the regulations in play. Um, and then um, as of September 28th, we'll see uh, the branding, the it related to um, on all signage with the logos, there must be a disclaimer of 21 plus and that will, um, the waiver for that will end on September 28th. So we'll be reviewing um, a lot of that uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, a few others coming up soon. You'll see that we're starting to review the temporary license process as well as the renewal process at, in, in the regulations. So comment period is up and there will be hearings, um, public hearings on those in the next couple of weeks. And then as I had hinted, uh, another update is that um, the Barstool brand under our um, uh, pen uh, PSI is the actual um, holder of our operation certificate, but Barstool is the brand you're familiar with that will be replaced by ESPN Bet in the next couple of months as well. 
we um, recently received the first, it's really the second quarter of reporting, but the first uh, quarter one was only about a week long. So um, at the commission meetings on August 17th, August 24th, and September 7th, we reviewed all of the quarterly reports um, coming in from each operator. Uh, for the most part, they covered we revenues and taxes in that period, some really detailed information about the workforce and supplier diversity, responsible gaming metrics, um, including how the usage of their tools, what the numbers have looked like uh, for VSC and cool off periods and any of the timing metrics that they have within their apps. Um, the compliance review. The lottery relationships that they have uh, and the communications they've had with the lottery in the last few months, and then um, any community outreach that the brands um, and the applications and the operators as a whole have been um, pursuing and or achieving in the last few months. Um, you can find these uh, online, just like you could always get the quarterly reports from our retail licensees or for the lot for the casinos. Um, there are pages created now for each operator and all reports will continue to be posted to the website. Of course, you can inquire if you want them directly, but you can always find those. Uh, jobs highlight on that aspect was that we saw over 150 Massachusetts jobs through um, this reporting. Which is really interesting because, uh, you know, most of them are not in Massachusetts. So 75, a little over 75 of those were at the retail sports books, which is to be expected, right? But over 75 were also at our online operators. So that was interesting. And uh, we did look at the VSE enrollments as they were reported by the operators. And we saw that each operator had between zero and 200. So that's this slide for you. Um, you can see, and of course, some of these are much bigger applications and others are much smaller, but they are certainly looking at their VSE enrollments. Of course, some people may have uh, un or enrolled in several different applications. So this is not, you can't accumulate the, these totals and get a um, individual number. Um, you know, I could come in and say, I want to VSC from FanDuel, but I also want a VSC from WinBet. So they do have that, that option, but um, they're keeping track of not only VSC, but all of the metrics. They're required to report to us monthly on the usage of every tool in the responsible gaming um, tool set. So we see the cool off period, the, the difference um, in people opting in for time amounts, wagering amounts, all of those metrics. And now I'm going to hand that over to Andrew, and I can keep pumping through the slides for you, Andrew, if you just let me know where when you're ready. Yeah, sure. I've got some animations, but I'll let you know just to click your mouse. Um, so thanks, Crystal. Uh, before going into some of our recent event catalog updates, I'd first like to review some sports wagering revenue numbers with you, specifically focusing on the tax collected for the Commonwealth. Um, the first slide here just shows a breakdown of the numbers from our most recent month of August 2023, splitting our retail and online licensees. You can see the retail numbers at the top. And as a reminder, our retail licensees are taxed at 15% of sports wagering revenue, while our online operators are taxed at 20%. Um, and the number I'd like to draw to your attention, uh, Crystal, if you just click your mouse, um, is the total tax collected for the last month uh, for August, just over $4.5 million was collected in taxes from all of our operators, uh, our sports wagering operators. The next slide. Uh, this table is a fun breakdown. This further splits all, all of our 11 operators, the three retail again up at the top and the eight online or mobile operators showing a month over month breakdown for the previous three months since June, 2023. Um, if you can focus on the numbers, you can see a slight trend downwards in the tax collected over the past three months. And I'll go over that and some factors to include momentarily. Um, but first, let me draw your attention again to some numbers and Crystal touched on this. And if you could just click your mouse again, 
there are two leaders in total handle and total tax collected month over month. Uh, those are DraftKings and FanDuel. They attribute to 77, 77% of all wagers um, placed in the last month between all of our operators. Um, and then one more time on this one, Crystal. Uh, this is just a post from senior betting analyst, Bill Sparrows, highlighting some of those numbers. He's focusing more on the handle here, um, the total amount wagered by the betters in Massachusetts. And you can actually see those numbers just to the left um, of that post, nearly $315 million was wagered between all operators in Massachusetts uh, in just in August alone. Um, similarly, he also points out the leaders, DraftKings and FanDuel, leading the way in total handle, while BetMGM does lead that second group of operators. Um, and if you couldn't tell from the previous slide, most of the sports wagering activity is coming from our online operators. Uh, they carry a total 96% in total handle and 98% in total tax collected. And this is going all the way back to that very first sports wager at the end of January. Um, and I mentioned I get back to that regression and tax. This chart shows the taxes collected in the first three months since mobile operators went live on that March 10th date, uh, March through May compared to the three previous months, June through August. Uh, March through May brought in over $33 million in taxes, while the summer months of June through August brought in just under $17 million in taxes. Still with just over a total of $50 million collected in the six months combined. Uh, and then lastly, you can see that year to date number, which includes the month of February, and that loan date in January, again, all prior to our mobile operators going live. Uh, now this drop off can be attributed to many factors, most notably are the sports and options available to the betters. Um, in March, we saw not just the launch of our mobile operators, but also the first March Madness uh, tournament available to be wagered on. Um, April sees a multitude of items, the beginning of the baseball seasons while basketball and hockey are starting to wind down. Um, there's even the NFL draft at the end of the month. So all four major sports have action to be waited on. In May, MLB teams are starting to work through their early stages of the season. The basketball and hockey leagues are working through their postseason, as well as several other soccer leagues and some soccer tournaments finishing up. Um, with so much to offer in those spring months, the summer months contrast so greatly just due to the limited number of options available for sports wagering. Um, at our next presentation, we do hope to see this trend back upwards with the inclusion of many more offerings. Crystal, next slide, yeah. Um, this line graph is just showing you the same thing. It's just with the taxes collected, just represented it in a different uh, fashion. You can see the slight recent trend downwards. Um, however, as I mentioned, we do hope to see this increase during the NFL and college football seasons, as well as the NBA and NHL seasons starting back up along with the baseball playoffs uh, beginning as well, all happening this fall. And one more slide for revenue. Um, I always find this uh, breakdown to be very helpful, just shows how the taxes are collected um, and how they're distributed amongst the Commonwealth. Um, and this is the first time or only time I'll mention the category two licensees, which you see the very top, they be treated just like the retail tax at 15%. Um, currently, we do not have any category two licensees. Moving on to event catalog updates, uh, pursuant to the regulation 24703, petition for a sporting event or wager category, the commission will consider any petition request from the operators and may grant, deny, limit, or restrict the request. On August 24th, 2023, the commission unanimously voted to include a new sport, pickleball, as an improved event to be wagered on. Currently, only PPA Tour, the Professional Pickleball Association sanctioned events, may be wagered on in Massachusetts. And I believe only one operator, the operator who submitted the petition has submitted house rules to include wagering for the new sport at this time. Uh, pickleball became the first sport to be added to the event catalog since March of 2023, around the same time our online operators went live. Um, and I mentioned pickleball, the most recently approved sport to be added. However, other sports have been requested and presented to the commission in May, just days after our last GPAC meeting or presentation, 
five sports were presented. However, they were not approved at that time. And coincidentally enough, one of those sports, High Lie, returns tomorrow to be presented again before the commissioners. Uh, and that concludes the sports wagering division uh, portion of the presentation. Crystal and I would be happy to any, answer any questions that you may have for us. Thank you. I'm looking forward to when they put the Belmont Recreation Pickleball on because then you guys, I'll be right, I'll be on the board, right? <laughs> um, and this is Paul Picknelli, um, or, or uh, can I just jump in with questions? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Paul. So I'm just kind of curious, the, the recent announcement of uh, uh, Pickleball um, PPA and uh, Major League Pickleball, you know, um, merging has that been addressed with the uh, commission only so only events that are part of the ppa tour um part of that um the ppa tour sanctioned events are to be weighted on so if they are ml is it mlp right major major pickleball league or major league pickleball yeah uh, they're not part of the sanctioned ppa tour events i do not believe they're able to be wagered on but i was aware of that that merger as of last week yeah okay and, and if I, I think I may address this to Crystal, if I'm not, or anyone, I guess, uh, everybody's referring to the sports wagering as, um, as revenue. Do we have any stats on, on uh, participants? I know uh, uh, Crystal mentioned that there were 60,000 of them in the month of September. Do we have anything that's overall since the inception? Number of online? Um, we technically do though that information is um while we don't collect it because it's within their app they don't report they can report how many users are using their tools and we have an idea of that are you meaning unique users or um just you know, it's easier the answer to this in a way is it's easier to track the amount of wagers because you you could have all five apps so technically one individual could have all five apps so i think last time this was one of the questions because we brought forth how many unique user or users there were based on geo comply but that doesn't actually tell you and, and we were breaking it out by the city if you recall and um, everybody was concerned about that because the numbers were so elevated but you could have two phones and each phone would might have a different um login you could have one person has all you know all seven apps on their phone um so it's hard to tell how many individuals are using the apps, but we can, but they, we can tell how many users are within the app, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess so. And with these um, online incentives, um, it, it, it stands a reason that there'd be an individual having multiple apps, right? So they right. can get incentive from each one of the companies. Right. So when we've been asked about users, it's it's hard to tell because we can tell you users in the state, you know, the IDs, but we don't necessarily know whether that's one individual seven times or seven individuals one time. Um, so it's that can be a little bit challenging and it's um, it's part of the market share, a confidentiality component, why they don't report exactly how many users they have. But we can tell in some ways, like I said, the, the, the use of tools and whatnot, which is really important to say the you know, responsible gaming research and some of our diversity metrics and that they are providing some of that. So we're getting we're getting a little bit of an idea. And we do get from GeoComply the user ID number, but Again, it's it's not exactly how many individuals are using these apps. Okay, great. Thank you. I was wondering, I, I mean, I guess it's, we don't have a lot of year over year data, obviously. So I guess we'll get more vision into this in the future, but Crystal was the 60,000 new accounts. So of course that could be across all the apps, but was, right. was that a surprising number or what was in line or a disappointing number? Or do you have no vision on that? Because those are our sort of new customers, right? I'd say it was an informational metric, but I don't know that it was surprising. They are users, right? So, but it could be, say you had a bet MGM app pre last year and you decided to get better or Fanatics yeah. because they just launched because now they've got a great NFL promotion um, or you only had one of the apps and now you want to go to another one because, you know, of the type of right. wager you can make. So, it, again, it's it's a great 
metric to see that volume has increased, but we don't necessarily know how many people are new to the apps or new to the sports wagering, or were they just in retail before and now they're trying an app because we've seen some of that movement as well. Um, people right. getting a little more comfortable because now they've used the kiosks and they have familiarity and they're like, okay, I'll, tr I'll try it on my own, you know? Um, so I wouldn't say it was, it was nowhere near what we saw when we launched, right? Those were much bigger numbers, but it's definitely a good indicator of what the revenues and taxation is going to look like as, as people are making more um, movement in the NFL season. I don't know uh, if Andrew, I, you have anything to add to that, but. <laughs> okay. Perfectly stated, Chris. Andrew, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, any update on the two remaining retail uh, brick and mortar sports books? The no, category Raynham. twos? Yeah, Raynham and Suffolk Downs. No, no update as, yet, uh, as of yet, no. And then um, I didn't have enough time to <laughs> look this up, but um, Bally's, I, I know there was a prohibition in Rhode Island law against them opening a casino in Massachusetts. I, I, I don't know if there's a exemption to them doing a sports book um, as well, but I don't, I don't know if either you had any insight on that. Um, I might pass that one to the chair. Yeah, I can, uh, you know, Jamie, that's interesting. We didn't hear of that prohibition, but certainly Valleys and, and Crystal is there every step of the way, um, uh, did apply for the Cat 3, um, uh, temporary license and it was awarded it and the they just haven't launched operationally and they've given us an, the most recent update we've learned through our sports wagering division is is early 24 so they're presumably there's they're not in violation of Rhode Island law mm -hmm. yes I I hadn't heard anything about that I mean I was trying to like go back to what seems like a long time ago, right, Chair, um, on yeah. anything we would have heard prior to their application period. But as as the Chair said, they've had the opportunity to launch all this time. They just would have to come forward with like, you know, their final house rules and everything to get their operation certificate. But they're just not ready to launch. They've chosen to delay at this point. So um, that's why we anticipate both will be on board in 2024. So they're ready to go. They're just... Um, when their operations are ready, they will move forward. Crystal, um, to, to address both uh, Chair Serper and, and uh, Committee Member Picknelli's question, do you think that Director Ban could highlight the map that he's in front of? Um, <laughs> you might wanna explain it and, and uh, how they can access it because it doesn't give specific numbers, but it does describe activity. Director uh, Band, the one behind me? Yes. Yeah. Actually, this is just a still photograph of it. <laughs> this is the geocomply map for the state of Massachusetts behind me. And actually, if you ever visit our, our reception area, you'll see it live. This map shows every wager live time being made in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the uh, white dots are every uh, Apple product making wagers live time. The uh, uh, green dots are uh, Android products making bets live time. The blue ones are uh, a, a Mac or a regular PC making a wager. And the red dots are rejected wagers. So most of the times you see those outside the boundaries here. Uh, and if it's a red space, that is usually a reservation. Uh, Spot on it. It's kind of an interesting and mesmerizing map. Uh, you get near Matt, uh, March Madness, and this is nothing but flags coming down at you all the time. And it's a 24 7 live map of every wager being made in the state. Uh, but if you visit our our office, you'll see it in the lobby. It's kind of, kind of a neat uh, thing. And this is geo comply, and it's how you know whether it's a legal wager or, or illegal wager. And that's yeah, where we get that user data that provides us with the transaction yes. number. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, it, it's a compliance around geofencing to ensure that um, a bet is placed within uh, 
Commonwealth's boundaries. So. As you see, you can make wagers from your boat up to three miles offshore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a really cool map, Bruce. Yeah, it, it is, especially to see it live. You find yourself standing there staring at it. Yeah. Um, okay, so do we have other any other questions for Crystal and Andrew? Well, uh, not seeing any. Thank you both for that. Uh, it's a lot of information, a lot of numbers, right? We're be interesting. It's really going to be interesting to see it play out over the first 20, 12 months, and then the next twelve months. At least for me, that's the way I look at it. Um, Chair Serpa, could I just add one thing? Um, and maybe I missed it. Yeah. Um, Andrew, did you give the um, if you have if you remember offhand the um, amount of taxes collected? since March, I think it- Yeah, the total, it, so the total year to date of since that January 31st launch date was just over 50 million, uh, 50 million, 376,000 and change. Yeah, 50.3 million. So um, oh, there's commission, I mean, are giving us a thumbs up, 50.3 million, yeah. So that's, right. a, I think, an important number. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, with nothing else, I think we'll move on, if that's okay with everyone, right? Good. All right. So next on the agenda is about some of the internal work that's being done at the commission, right? Uh, it's a presentation on diversity initiatives at the commission. Uh, Kathy went over it a little bit and the individuals who we'll be hearing from in her opening. So I guess I will turn it directly over to David and Boniswa. I'm not sure who's going first, but sure. take it um, away. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chair Serpa, Madam Chair, um, committee members and uh, commissioners present. Um, I came on board approximately a year and a half ago uh, my background as the chief people and diversity officer, my background is about 30 years, private sector and positions of progressive responsibility and working for the Commonwealth seven years as the assistant secretary for employer services for the executive office of labor workforce development. Um, what I'd like to do is to introduce my colleague, uh, Bonisa, uh, Benita, um, Sunday, please. Denise, what could you be on mute? I, I was talking and it says I was muted. Thank you. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> so I am Bonisa Sunday. I am the DI um, Senior Program Manager, and I've been with the agency for four months. Um, previous to that, I've worked in the same um, field at my previous company. Okay. So what we'd like to we would like to start with our agenda. Um, so Benisa, why don't you go through the agenda, and then I'll pick it up from there. Right. I just want to make sure you guys can see my screen. Let me pull it back up again. Hold on. Yeah, we were able to see it. Okay, great. All right. Um, it looks perfect. Thank you. Outstanding. So this is the agenda. We're going to kind of get a little bit into the history of DEI at MGC. We're going to talk about the core values, our MGC diversity action plan. We're going to meet a little bit of our team internally. We'll, of course, you guys want to hear about those stats going on here. So we're going to talk about those stats, um, a little bit about some of the initiatives and outreach that we have, and we'll leave it open for questions at the end. Yes. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair created the MGC Equity and Inclusion Group um, going on three years now. And the purpose of this group, I won't go through it all, but purpose of the group, it's committed to racial equity and justice, diversity and inclusion. And the critical nature here, it expects the same of its employees, licensees and our stakeholders. The key paragraph here is in our, in our society at large, there are systems, policies, and practices that continue to yield inequitable outcomes. As a result of these systems, 
communities of color are disproportionately negatively affected and or afforded benefits opportunities to a lesser degree. Although the MGC remains committed to safeguarding all protected classes from discrimination, recent national events have underscored the urgency for us all as an agency to take action on racial equity. We recognize that in addressing systematic issues, everyone who's part of the system has an opportunity, responsibility to examine how these systems work and to dismantle barriers and obstructing racial equality. We embrace anti-racism as a guiding principle. Anti-racism in contrast to an absence of racism calls for proactiveness. On the topic of racial equity, neutrality is insufficient, preserves the status quo and is equivalent to an abdication of moral obligation. As such, the MGC adopts these principles and pledges to follow a proactive approach of continuous engagement towards developing and ensuring an environment of equity and justice. Next slide, please, Benice. Our core values. Encouragement of open exchange of ideas and particip particip participation of our employees. We want to create an environment where groups and individuals can freely express their ideas and thoughts. Commitment to transparent gaming licensing processes to make sure as we go through our communities and we're dealing with the um, licensees, employees, that it is a transparent process as we proceed. And critically, strict adherence to ethical standards in licensing and regulation. We embrace diversity in our workforce as well as the internal supplier base. Our core values, which we are, which, which exist and we continue to develop, our develop is critical to building a foundation of um, equity, inclusion, and to make sure that all folks are treated um, equally. Next slide, please. So I, I'll you take I'll the jump, next one. Yeah. yeah, I'll jump on here. Um, so when when the equity and inclusion team got together, they just didn't make that mission statement, but they actually um, proposed action plans. And that's part of the reason why um, Chief Modrill was hired. And that was part of the reason why he expanded his team to hire me, because it's a lot of work. DEI is a lot of work. And what people don't realize, it is just not about um, diversity, equity, inclusion. People tend to just focus on the diversity portion of the piece. And, and they focus on gender diversity and racial diversity, but equity and inclusion in all three of those encompass everything that we do. And so we have these action plans or goals that center around the cultural transformation internally. We want to foster an inclusive agency culture. We are building that in the process now. And part of that is we're we're delivering training. We have delivered tra training in the past, but again, you know, in order for this to become part of people's everyday existence, it has to be trained over and over again. That's how we learn. The more things are more familiar to you, the more you're going to walk the walk and talk the talk. We need to have transparent communication and reporting on anti-racism efforts as well. And we are going to establish a culture club for sharing those experiences and resources. That's forthcoming. I'm really excited about that. With regards to regulatory review, we need to integrate an anti-racist perspective into regulatory reviews. And we're going to look at this every three years. Um, we're, we're ensuring that regulations don't disproportionately harm or hinder communities of color. We are also looking at an enhanced customer service, reviewing our policy and procedures to ensure fairness, accessibility, and economic opportunities for people of color. And within that, especially internally, we have to look at our diverse hiring and retention. You know, we have to improve internal hiring and retention practices to boost diversity. And we'll talk about that a little bit of how we are fair with regards to that when we talk about some of our stats. So we need to focus on our job descriptions. Now, people think when you're talking about um, 
re looking at job descriptions to make it inclusive means that you're lowering standards. You're not lowering standards. You're making sure that the language is inclusive that so that we can get gender diverse people to apply for the um, positions that when they're worded seem to be male oriented. Um, we There's also um, in regards to getting diverse talent as well. So we have to look at that. And part of that is that we have to do the outreach. We have to do mentoring. You know, it, we have to let people know that we welcome diversity. If people don't feel welcome, they're not gonna wanna apply. And we also have to do that with our procurement enhancement and continue to broaden, you know, our policies to increase spending with minority owned businesses. So, since I've been here, I think that we've been doing a good job. <laughs> um, and people can also speak to that to see if they, they feel the same. We have a team. So we have, so Madam Chair created the equity inclusion team. And from that, we needed a core team too, right? Um, and this is our core team is it falls on the HR umbrella, although we want everyone within the agency to be DEI champions. Um, but we have a core team to look for people to refer to when they have those questions. So you ha we have Chief Mo Drew, who is um, our head. And then um, on that team, we have Ann Mezzeri. She um, does our data and analytics. Tripti Banda is our human resource manager. We have Dean Ventola. He is our HRBP. He primarily focuses on the recruitment efforts. And Natasha Martin, with, uh, who really supports Tripti with regards to HR issues. And then we, I told you we we're gonna talk about a little, a few of our stats. So how are we doing? Well, our agency now is 31% diverse. This is huge. And we're seeing more diversity as we continue to go on. 48% of that are women. Now we've had some challenges over the years with women, especially after the pandemic, we've seen a decline in women, um, but we have been on an upward trend and the, our numbers are, uh, recovering from that as well. And we have had $3.6 million in diversity spend in the year 2022. With regards to our diversity outreach, and this is just for 2023, right now we're looking um, towards working towards an internship. We are working with one of our community partners, um, the, uh, um, the Boston Chamber of Commerce, with their pay setters program, they're actually doing DI training on procurement. They're doing an unconscious bias with regards to procurement next week in which we're, they asked us to participate with. We were just recently on um, a career fair with Recruit Military where we had over 20 veterans visit our table. And from that, we also received 58 veterans who looked at open positions that we have here at the agency. And actually, we had one apply, and this was just four days ago, so that that we claim that as a win as well. And in October, we're going to um, also be a part of the career fair at the Black Expo. And uh, that kind of concludes it. I know it was short and sweet. Does anyone have any questions? Anishwa, do you want to take down your slide? If you're sure. able to, please, thanks. So are there any questions we could we could field? We appreciate you listening and hopefully you may have some questions we may be able to answer. I'll just interject. I am super proud of this um, accomplishment. I see my, my fellow commissioner uh, who can actually speak because it's only two of us on this public meeting. We're very careful about open meeting law. Um, but um, the progress that has been made, uh, it, um, this group was convened in June of 2020, and we um, we did uh, effectively come up with five um, action items, as Vanessa mentioned. And the commission it started in June, we convened in June, and by September, the uh, statement of purpose was put together, and the, the five commissioners unanimously supported these efforts and. If they were all here, there's a little bit of a few of us who are held over, you know, um, we, um, we would be really proud of these statistics. So great work. Thank you. 
King Serpa, could I chime in? You're on mute. Oh. Oh, sorry. Not you, Victor. Now you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. It's the technical difficulties. I I apologize. Let me just say that I first want to um thank and and really appreciate um Chair. Uh, Kathy Judge Stein for her leadership in this space. Um, it's refreshing. I thank you for, for this work. I know that you and I have had multiple conversations about DEI in the past, and I appreciate not only your efforts, but your openness and willingness to, uh, have, to have space for those conversations. And then obviously uh, the steps that have been taken at the Mass Gaming Commission. I also want to reiterate that um, folks know that diversity, equity, inclusion is central to the work of the Department of Public Health. It's, it's part of our work that we lead with in the context of our responsibility and mitigation harms associated with gambling. And I can't stress enough of the importance of, of DEI specifically in this space when we understand that the data tells us that people of color are disproportionately impacted by gambling. And, it, and it's a, in a position that I have continued to, stick, to take are, are two. One is that um, when we look at our work and our responsibility that we have, uh, we, we cannot reach the goal that has been put forth by this legislation or the legislation uh, to, mitigate, to mitigate harms associated with gambling unless we centralize equity. Um, and, and that to me is really important. And the other point is that uh, this is particularly important in this space because the field of gambling has historically been disconnected from the community experience of gambling and people of color. Mm -hmm. um, so this takes on a different level of meaning, but once again, I just wanna say, Kathy, thank you so much uh, for your leadership in this space, it's refreshing. And, and I'm just um, grateful to see it materialize from three years ago when you were conceptualizing it and seeing it happening at the Gaming Commission. So congratulations to you and the team. And obviously, if anything of the Department of Public Health can be any support in this ongoing effort, because it's all of our responsibility um, we're always open for that. So thank you guys. Great presentation. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you, Victor, for your comments. And yes, on behalf of this committee, David, Bonisa, thank you very much for your activity, for your hard work. And I know there's no doubt, like Victor said, Kathy, Chair Judd Stein's leadership, I'm sure, helped uh, you navigate it at the agency. And we appreciate that hard work. Thank you. Yes, sir, absolutely. And I would very much like to point that out, that um, working in organizations, large organizations, private, corporate, I've worked in organizations where it was more of a task. Here, it's successful because it's driven from the very top. And that's how this works. That's how it will always work. So uh, we certainly appreciate Madam Chair for her support and making this happen. And we thank you for your time. Okay, thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone. And, and, and you know, I think that we um, should really think about uh, Chair Serpa bringing time on the agenda for Victor's presentations, our outstanding work that the Department of Public Health is doing in this space and Victor's leadership. So um, Grace, that's a, a good note for a future agenda item. And I see Victor's willingness to to um, participate, that'd be great. All right, yep, that's a terrific idea. We'll Thanks, Chair Serpa. I'm just, I just um, took over your agenda setting process. <laughs> My apologies. No, but... that's fine, <laughs> it's a, a good idea. Um, so uh, with, if there's no other questions, I'll move on to uh, Community Mitigation Fund. I think, um, so let's see, that's the next agenda item, but Joe, um, I think what I'd like to do, so I think we're gonna have some commentary, uh, maybe a case study of sort that uh, member Pignelli was gonna bring up to us. And I know he has uh, a hard stop. So Joe, if it's okay with you, maybe we let Paul do a, a case study of how one of these projects can be successful and then we'll get the update from you. Is that okay? Absolutely, whatever your pleasure. Well, right. uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Serpa, for allowing me to uh, speak. 
I, I guess out of order, I, I did mention to him uh, prior to uh, uh, the start of the meeting that I had a hard 3.30 because of the agenda item was scheduled to end at 3.30. I just wanted to make sure that I had the opportunity to speak. So um, thank you again. Uh, and um, as uh, Commissioner uh, Judge Stein was mentioning, $8 million has been committed uh, you know, to uh, Region B or the Springfield area since the inception of the community mitigation uh, funds have been uh, uh, you know, sent out. So the latest uh, uh, item that was approved was $1.5 million to the city of Springfield uh, for the improvement of traffic flow and assistant economic development uh, in and around uh, MGM Springfield in the Mass Mutual area which is uh, very important for our city. It's, I would tell you, it's probably the number one goal from the mayor's office. I do know it's the number one goal from the city council office. And just in general, I think it's the number one goal of the citizens in general of uh, Springfield to have redevelopment that is uh, outside of the 14 acres that MGM Springfield occupies. Um, uh, Commissioner Judge Stein was in Springfield last week, along with myself, who was uh, attended a presentation on behalf of the city that identified a company called McCaffrey Inc. Um, and its president, uh, Ed uh, Woodbury, was presenting the fact that he is the preferred developer of two major pieces of property across the street from MGM. It's also uh, directly across the street from the Mass Mutual Center. Um, and also is uh, across the street from uh, what is um, a major redevelopment of housing in downtown Springfield. It's called 31 Elm Street. And if I can just step back uh, and if I can just look, um, uh, City Hall, it, it, there's, a, there's a piece of art that's right behind me. I'm in my conference room and I, and I chose to sit here because I wanted you to get an identification, but the artwork that's in my background here is uh, of City Hall and uh, of the uh, First Church in Springfield. The, the uh, $1.5 million in part is um, spent directly across the street from this area, which is only maybe 300 feet from the front door of MGM Springfield. Uh, first Church in Springfield uh, was built in, um, uh, was uh, first built in 1645. Uh, there's been a, a couple of churches built on the site. The current uh, building was built in 1819 and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1972. Um, it's one of the most iconic uh, structures in downtown Springfield. And um, we're so pleased that uh, the city is spending an additional $8 million renovating the park that's right outside this church, directly across the street from uh, City Hall, directly across the street from 30 and Elm Street, which is a $60 million housing project that will have 72 market rate housing uh, in downtown Springfield. And again, this is all within about 300 feet from uh, MGM Springfield. Uh, finally, after uh, five years of uh, MGM uh, opening, they just celebrated their fifth anniversary. Uh, major development is, is is being constructed in and around MGM Springfield, and uh, the entire city is applauding all of that. Uh, and thanks to the Mass Gaming Commission for providing this additional one point five million dollars. And again, I think the economic development outside of Spring uh, of outside MGM Springfield is paramount in everybody's mind that this is exactly what we um, want to see. And if I go back in time, the, um, the Mass Legislature uh, put together the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, proposals for, for all these operators to um, respond to. One of the goals and objective is how can uh, casinos uh, work in conjunction with the cities and towns outside the actual property level. And this is exactly what the casino legislation was, uh, was written for. And I couldn't be prouder to know that uh, the Mass Gaming Commission has uh, approved these additional funds and it's, uh, it's doing exactly what uh, it was intended to do. So um, on behalf of MGM, uh, they thank you for your support 
uh, the financial uh, commitment for these additional funds. And um, I'm happy to address anybody's questions that they have regarding this. Any questions for Paul? I, I know that spot well, Paul. I've, I've been there many, many times uh, for many different types of events. It's really the, the heartbeat location of the city, right? So uh, if, if there's a place to, to make to make better, that's the one. And I can only imagine the impact it'll have on people using that space. It's the number one. Member. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chair, no question. It's, it's, the, it's the place to go if you wanna be with people in a large setting in the downtown area, outdoors, anyhow. Any, so great, great news, yeah. Paul. And I'm glad, you know, the commission was able to approve that. Mr. Mayor was there too. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say to Paul, um, uh, Chair Judd Stein and myself were picking out units in Elm on the Elm Street project. <laughs> we just thought it was fantastic. And, and, yeah. and I mean, really echoing what um, Chair Serpa just said, I mean, you can see it. You know, some of the places, the mitigation funds um, go further than others, and you can just see it in the projects. and walking around there with the chair and, and my fellow commissioners, fantastic uh, yep. work that they're doing with this money and, and really making those dollars go far. And and we love it, we love the project. Yeah, it's it's echoed by, uh, by everyone in the city of Springfield. There's no question in everybody's mind, this is where we need to start the redevelopment uh, outside the, uh, the 14 acres of MGM Springfield. Great. And Dean, you'll appreciate like uh, uh, Chair Serper, my apologies. Um, you would appreciate the fact that the RFP process selecting the um, uh, construction company was done, um, you know, in a very transparent, full, um, um, uh, search, full national search way, but really under a pretty short timeline, Paul, if I recall correctly. And yeah, I, I'm not so sure I can recall, but it was again short, but maybe uh, four or five months. That's what I think, exactly. Yeah. So um, really good government processes at work. I think um, one correction, and, and I'm going to turn to Chief Delaney, I had mentioned the eight point whatever uh, figure, million dollar figure. I think that was for, only for grants to Springfield proper, Paul. So I think there's a bigger number for Region B, which would include um, areas and communities, uh, surrounding communities that are affected by the um, casino. And I don't know, Joe, if you want to share that bigger number for Region B, if you have it, you may not have it. Uh, or yeah, it may be embedded in your memory, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have it at my fingertips, but uh, that, no, but that 8 million is just for Springfield proper. Um, you know, West Springfield has received quite a lot of uh, monies from us, as have many of the other surrounding communities. So, um, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the total is, but it's significantly greater than the uh, the eight million uh, just yeah. just went to Springfield. But the we, eight million, yeah, very so. much. Yeah. All right. Well, thank thank you, Paul. Um, certainly, if there was a four or five month procurement process completed, so, somebody was managing it well because that's an extraordinary timeline for any any project like that. Okay. But so listen. We, We've stepped a little bit on, on Joe's time, so let me introduce him. Uh, in, in the meeting, in our last meeting in May, um, the membership wanted to make sure we got a picture, a complete picture of the 2023 Community Mitigation Fund grants. So to do that, we invited uh, Joe Delaney, Chief of Community Affairs at the Commission, to give us detail at this meeting um, on the entire program. We just heard one snippet from from Paul. Um, so let's do that. We'll turn it over to Joe and um, hear about the entirety of this year's program, 10.2 million. And um, well, I'm sure many successful stories like we just heard. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so in your packets today, you've got the press release that we did on um, the uh, 2023 fund, which that outlines all of the particular grants and gives you some information on them. And I'm not gonna dwell on, on all of those. Uh, but as the chair said, 10.2 million went out uh, this year. 
that was down a little bit from uh, 2022, uh, which was at about 10.6 million. You know, a couple of reasons for that. We had we had a lot of uh, communities that were having real difficulty uh, keeping staff members. Um, we actually had uh, a few different communities submit grant applications, but withdraw them because they didn't believe that they'd be able to administer them uh, due to staff shortages. In fact, and one of those, in fact, was the city of Boston. They they lost like three or four people uh, in their uh, their grant department uh, and said, well, we're going to have to kind of pull back a little bit. So anyway, uh, so our numbers were down just a little bit previously, but uh, since the beginning of time, uh, almost $48 million has gone out in this program, which is great. Um, and we use our, we have our usual uh, list of categories in which we, we give out these grants, which are uh, primarily community planning. We do a lot of those helping communities uh, you know, do uh, planning things like marketing plans and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of public safety where we provide some money for things like overtime for uh, uh, late night police patrols, things like that. Uh, a lot of equipment. Um, we have our transportation planning category and our transportation construction category, which is the funds that, that uh, Paul was talking about, uh, transportation construction funds that we provided uh, for uh, Springfield. And then the other main category is our workforce development, uh, where we funded uh, uh, grants in uh, one grant uh, in Region A, one grant in Region B at half a million dollars uh, each year. So, uh, and for each region, I should say. And um, so those are the kinds of things that we've been doing for the last several years. But I wanted to focus on here was we introduced two new types of grants for, uh, for 2023. Uh, the first one was uh, the gambling harm reduction grant. And, and, and part of this was, this extends a little bit on the research that Mark Vanderlinden and his team do. Uh, but what we wanted to do is try to get money right to the communities to try to help them identify uh, populations that might be at risk for problem gambling and to, to do some studies that might help um, evaluate alternatives to reduce those harms. And while the first year of it wasn't as successful as we had hoped it would be, a couple of projects came out of that that were really great. And I wanted to just highlight one. And this was in the city of Boston uh, for the Powell Arts Center. Um, the Powell Arts Center is, is in the Asian community and, and provides uh, uh, different kinds of programming for the Asian community in Boston. And uh, they came into us for a grant that came directly from a study that had been done previously by, uh, by Mark Vanderlinden's group, which was the Asian CARES study. And one of the things that the Asian CARES study said was that, um, that folks in the Asian community need some alternatives, some alternative things to do rather than going to the casino. Going to the casino is very convenient. It's very, uh, you know, uh, the uh, people at the casino will speak the language and so on. And the idea here was they, they are doing some additional programming that will give uh, people in the Asian community in Boston alternatives uh, to going to the casino, which, and this is again, a recommendation that came directly out of a study that we did earlier. So the idea with this uh, gambling harm reduction category where this one is actually an implementation project what we're looking to do as well is, is get money to communities to start studying these things uh, and, and, and developing those kinds of solutions. And the other one that we did uh, give a grant for was for the city of Springfield. And that was um, to look at um, the impact of gambling on youth. So we're looking at, at, at folks between 18 and 24. So some of those folks are even, you know, are underage to go to the casino. But you know, the, the idea is that, that these folks are being targeted by commercials and other things and, and are being exposed to this. And the city wanted to find out what kind of an impact that is having on the, the youth of the city. So, we, so a small grant was given to the city for that. And our hope is that that might, might blossom into a larger study and that would identify some you know, potential um, alternatives to, to try to reduce that potential for, for gambling harm. So, even though the first year of this program was, was relatively small, we're really excited that uh, 
the communities will will kind of grab onto this and, and really uh, try to look at this issue going forward. And then the other um, category that we added was what we are calling projects of regional significance. Um, again, it was brand new for this year. We had a couple of applications and the one that we awarded was um, to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And uh, this was to um, improve the capacity of small businesses in the Pioneer Valley. So one, so this this uh, category needs to to look at some a project that is regionally significant, but also addresses a casino related impact. As always, all of our funds have to go towards mitigating impacts of the casino. We can't just use these funds for sort of general purposes. Um, so the impact that's associated here with the casino is you know MGM has had some difficulty in meeting their goals for minority women veteran businesses. They've been trying, but you know, but have fallen short. And the idea that uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission had was, hey, if we can work with some of these small, these small businesses, uh, minority women veteran businesses, and try to build their capacity to help them bid on projects, um, on bigger projects, on bigger you know, uh, supplies and, and, and things of that nature, that that would help MGM meet their goals, but it would also help the entire Pioneer Valley region uh, by, by making these firms more competitive and uh, being able to better, to better compete against um, uh, other firms and, and hopefully lift up uh, those small businesses, small minority women veteran businesses, particularly um, to, to, to meet one of the particular goals that the commission has. So those are the, the, the two that, that I wanted to focus on um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Like I said, I'm not gonna go through the, the whole list. There's, there's quite a long list of projects and a lot of good things that people are doing, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions on that. And if there are none, I wanted to give you a little uh, flavor of what we're gonna be doing for next year. Questions for Joe? I was wondering, Joe, on the workforce development grants, you know, because I'm relatively new, is the like the mass hire grant, is that something that happens on an annual basis or is that a one time grant? No, that's we we put that out every year. Um, it is competitive, but we do require a consortium to come in. So groups tend to work together. So typically we only receive the one application per region. So in the east we have mass hire and out west we have Holyoke Community College partnered with Springfield Technical Community College and the city of Springfield. Um, so they do all, all sorts of different uh, things, English speakers of other languages, uh, GED kinds of things. We have culinary, we have a, a whole um, host of, of training programs. Yeah. And, and, Joe, and, and, I think, and, uh, Chair Serpa, I think Jamie's um, um, work has been the beneficiary of mass hires. Am I right on that, Jamie? Correct, yeah, um, been a great partner. Well, yeah, anytime, you know, anytime there can be more funding for job training, it's going to help in the bigger picture, right? Especially with the um, the job market right now. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, one of the questions actually for next year that we have for the commission coming up is whether or not we want to try to expand uh, the amount of money that we're putting towards training. Right. Um, Anything else for Joe or Joe, do you want to give us a picture of, of what's upcoming? Yeah, I, I just wanted to give you a, a little idea of what we have coming up for next year. Um, so one of the most difficult things that, that our communities have is making that nexus between what they want to do, between the um, impact of the casino and, and the projects that they want to do. And what we've found is that even th through our own research, and through other research that kind of drawing that bright line between an impact of the casino and, and, and a project is often very difficult. Um, so what our proposal this year is, is two things. One is we are looking at all of our own research, but we're also looking at research from many other jurisdictions across the country and even across the world um, to, to uh, and we're doing a, um, uh, 
you know, we're, we're looking at all of the research that's out there to try to identify what are the recognized impacts of the casinos. And in doing that, you know, in the past, what we said to our communities was, well, tell us what the impact is, and then kind of quantify that impact, and then tell us how you're going to fix it. And we realized that that, while that sounds simple, it's not as nearly as simple as it sounds. So our thought was that if the commission itself can say, these are the impacts that we recognize are likely to be caused by the casino. And again, you can't always make that saying this is absolutely caused by the casino or not. Um, that, that, that we recognize those. And now the community doesn't have to work quite so hard to try to identify the impact and try to quantify it. We've already said it's an impact. And then in doing that, what we are also proposing is to change this program from just a kind of a competitive grant program into more of a block grant program for the communities. So for what, what we're working on now is developing a formula that we would use to say that um, for each community, we would, we would set an, a, a set amount of money for each community. And um, at the end of November, beginning of December, we would send a letter out to the community saying, you are eligible for X number of dollars. What you need to do is write a work plan that, that complies with our guidelines to tell us how you're gonna use that money. And so instead of it being a, you know, kind of some more of a crapshoot for the communities, they know that there's a set amount of money set aside for them. Now, maybe they're not able to use all of it and that's okay too. Um, but what we want to do, what we heard from many of our communities, especially our smaller communities, is that they don't, and even from some of our larger communities this year, is that they, they don't have the, the staff to be writing grant applications and doing these things when they don't have any guarantee that they're going to get the grant. So the thought here is that we, we, will, we will tell the communities how much they can get. They submit an application. And, and once we concur that you know, all of their projects meet our guidelines, the grant would be then given to them rather than this other process. And, it's, and it's, this is set up kind of like the, the Federal Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, and all of our communities are very excited about this. Um, you know, having some certainty on how much money might be coming to you is, is, uh, is far more desirable than, uh, you know, putting in an application knowing that you may or may not get it. Um, so everybody seems excited about it. We've talked to the regional planning agencies. They like it. We, we've gotten really nothing but um, uh, good feedback on this so far. and. Um, you know, so we're moving ahead with this uh, program and with hopes to implement it for uh, 2024. Uh, in fact, we go to the commission tomorrow with a whole bunch of uh, policy questions and a draft of our formula for distributing the funds. And uh, we've been meeting with our local community mitigation advisory committees. And in fact, before I joined this meeting, I was meeting with the uh, GPAC subcommittee on community mitigation uh, to get input on all of these things. So um, I think it's, it's, really, uh, it's really an exciting approach, I think, to take for this program. Um, as I said, communities have had quite a lot of difficulty in, in getting funds from this program because you have to make that nexus to the casino and, and making that easier and then giving them a set amount of money, we just think um, it will get the money to the communities in a far more effective manner. And, um, hopefully be a, a little bit more transformative uh, for those communities. Well, it makes a lot of sense, right? You're, you're taking away the, the main disincentive for, for putting in an application, right? Which is that you don't know if you're gonna get it. So you take that away, they still have to build a compelling argument for you to, to for the board to approve, right? But it makes the process a lot more circular, you know, the the, the grants there, give me a compelling reason. It's approved, it's yours. So that makes sense. Good, good move. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions for Joe? Oh, no, really quickly, um, I have a quick question if I may, just so that I understand it. So Absolutely. is the new vision is to be able to provide the community mitigation funds to the community, and if so, 
who who would be the administrators? Are we are we thinking about the cities? Um, I mean, can you just explain that? Who who would be with the recipients of those dollars to manage it if it's in a block grant format? Yeah, so so we have a set number of communities that are eligible to participate in the community mitigation fund, which okay. are essentially the host communities and the and the surrounding communities. Um, they're the ones that are that are designated to, to submit. So all of those communities would get some money as part of the block grant, and they okay. would be administered by the by the individual city or town themselves. Yeah. Got it. Thank you, and Joe. The, and the other piece of it that I that I didn't mention, but I probably should have that. You know those things like the workforce grants, and we have some money that goes to like the DA's offices and and a few mm -hmm. other uh, you know sort of regional entities that are eligible. We will be pulling some money. We'll be setting aside some money so that those will continue. It, those won't go away. Um, they'll they'll be administered a little bit differently. Uh, but you know the lion's share of the money goes out to the cities and towns, and they are the ones that have had uh, more difficulty. So the block grant is just for the cities and towns. We'll have some set aside funds for those other entities that, that that get money from us as well. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Anything else for Joe? That makes sense. Well, we'll look forward to hearing about how that process worked out. I guess a year from now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Much more to come. <laughs> okay. Um, so that was our our main business for the meeting, but I guess I'll check with our committee members, um, Jamie or Victor or even Caitlin, if you have any other updates that you want to share with the group about, um, about what you've been working on, the gaming in your communities or, or any other topic, really. This is your time if you have something. I'm good, thank you, Chair. Okay. Victor, yeah. all set? Yes, I don't have any any major updates at this time. Thank you. Caitlin? All set for today. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. Um, okay, so moving, I guess we'll talk about our next GPAC meeting then. That would be the last thing we need to do today. It's uh, what, September 20th? So I guess I would suggest that we meet again uh at the beginning of the new year right um unless there's a pressing subject that comes up i think that makes sense do people have any um other ideas about when would make sense or does that work for everybody all right so uh chair Judd stein and i and, and grace will will get together and come up with a proposed date for that and you'll get your notification is there any recommendations from the group here, anybody here about information that they know they want to make sure is covered in our next meeting? All right, that, that's okay too. So uh, Kathy and I and others will make sure that we come up with the most germane information for that meeting and we'll put it together. Any other? questions or comments from people today. Just a thank you for letting me crash the meeting and and take my late lunch because I hadn't been able to eat today. So um, I appreciate it and found it very informative. Yeah, thank you for attending Commissioner. All right, not hearing any other business. Um, I would ask if there's a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. Do I really even need to ask that, Grace? But I will. Is there a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. We have adjourned. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Appreciated all the information from the staff, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone and learning more moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good to see everybody. Thank you.